look, it's me. What's the weirdest thing about me? Aside from this photo, I'm a road geek. To the uninformed, this means I have an unusual fascination, or rather, obsession with roads, particularly the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System. Originally conceived in 1956, the interstate system has since amassed 70 different mainline interstates and hundreds of spurs, proving to be a crucial part of America's infrastructure and economy. Whether you're stuck in traffic on I-95 or creeping through the construction on I-70, you're never very far from the interstate system. But I'm not here today to talk about 95 or 70. The interstate I'm talking about here today isn't very popular or even used that much, but it is my home interstate and I have a strong connection to it. So without further ado, I introduce to you Interstate 72. Although the system as a whole fascinates me, I have an unusual obsession with this interstate in particular. Today, I'll be talking about the history of this route, the cities it visits, the route of US Route 36 in Missouri, and the potential of an extension further into Missouri of I-72. With any luck, this will be the last time I make a dedicated video on this road. Very little was known about the history of I-72 prior to its construction. All we can assume is that IDOT felt the need for a freeway between Champaign and Springfield because this is what the Route of 72 would later look like. The initial route of I-72 followed what used to be Illinois State Routes 10 and 47 from Champaign to White Heath, where 10 broke off. From here, 72 followed 47 all the way from White Heath to Decatur, where the route is then shifted over to US 36 for the remainder of its length. Perhaps the first indication of a future freeway between Springfield and Champaign came when US 36 was widened to four lanes on the east side of Decatur. It wasn't a particularly large widening, only lasting for about a mile or so, but it was an improvement nonetheless. The next sign of a future interstate was a new interchange. An exit for White Heath was built for Illinois 47 in the year 1962. The route was also widened to freeway standards for about a mile in each direction. However, nothing really happened in terms of freeway development for the next few years. Eventually, though, in 1967, a freeway stub was built on the south side of Springfield connecting Interstate 55 to Illinois Route 4. No other exits were built along it, but it is part of what would eventually become Western I-72. Reaching 1971, we see that the freeway section outside of Whiteheath was extended west to Champaign to meet I-57. Exits were built for Illinois 10 and Illinois 47 as well. In 1971, this section of freeway was the first to be officially designated as Interstate 72. No progress was made in 1972 between Decatur and Champaign. However, the aforementioned freeway stub in South Springfield was extended from its temporary end at Illinois 4 to another temporary end at US Route 36 just outside of Quran. No progress was made in the years 1973 or 1974. In 1975, plans were set into motion that called for a freeway between Interstate 55 outside of East Springfield to the Macon County line. More plans were also executed to build a freeway upgrade of US 36 between the end of the freeway stub in Springfield and US Route 67 in Jacksonville. Furthermore, a section of freeway between US 51 and Forsyth and Illinois 48 in Decatur was built, and construction was beginning on connecting this segment with Interstate 72 just outside of White Heath. By the year 1977, the original section of I-72 between Champaign and Springfield was complete, connecting the cities of Decatur and Monticello between them. The freeway section of US 36 from Curran to Illinois 104 outside of Jacksonville was also completed, though it didn't reach US 67 yet. More development ensued in the years of 1979 and 1980. Firstly, a section of freeway later signed as US 51 was built from the US 36 exit in Decatur to US 51 outside of Elwyn. Secondly, the freeway section of US 36 was completed from Illinois 104 to US 67 and was further extended west to what will later be known as the Winchester exit. Finally, a section of freeway outside of Quincy named Illinois 336 was built to connect US 24 to Illinois Route 96. No construction occurred between the years 1981 and 1982. No improvements were made on Main Line 72, and no construction occurred on the freeway extension of US 36, but Illinois Route 336 was extended from Illinois 96 to a new half-completed trumpet interchange outside of Fall Creek. This interchange led to a newly constructed two-lane road connecting 336 back to US 36 outside of Hannibal, Missouri. I-72 and Illinois 336 were void of improvements in the years 1985 and 1986, but construction began on extending US 36 as a freeway from the Winchester exit to Illinois 100 outside of Valley City. Between 1987 and 1988, the section between Winchester and 100 was completed, and construction began on connecting the US 36 freeway in Valley City to Illinois 336 in Fall Creek. In 1989 and 1990, construction continued and Illinois 336 was extended from the now completed Trumpet Interchange to a new interchange with Illinois 96 just outside of Hull. Around this time, US 36 was also granted exit numbers along its exits. 1991 and 1992 were uneventful years in terms of construction. Work continued, but no new sections of 36 or 336 were open to the public yet, and 72 was still just chilling between Springfield and Champaign. However, 1991 was an eventful year pertaining to 72 in a political sense. On June 1, 1991, Ashto officially approved the move to redesignate the US 36 freeway as Interstate 172, a spur of I-72 that began in Springfield at I-55. 
The planned 172 was going to run between Springfield and the Trumpet Interchange with Illinois 336 outside of Fall Creek. There was just one problem, though. The planned 172 spur was longer than 72 on its own. As a result, the freeway designation was not approved by the Federal Highway Administration until the label was changed from 172 to an extension of I-72. In 93 and 94, the construction on Future 72 was completed between Fall Creek and Illinois 100. However, the entirety of the route between Fall Creek and Springfield was still signed as just US 36, just with interstate exit numbering. By 1995, the entirety of the US 36 freeway was re-signed as I-72, and Illinois 336 between Fall Creek and US 24 was re-signed as I-172. For many years, this was how I-72 remained, an interstate with a barely used spur and no hope of ever going further in life. However, in September of the year 2000, the new Mark Twain Bridge had just finished construction. The old bridge, which carried US 36 for many years, was in need of replacement. As such, the new bridge was built in 2000 and was built to hold four lanes of interstate standard traffic. With the new bridge open, I-72 was extended from its old western terminus at I-172 in Fall Creek to a new terminus at US 61 in downtown Hannibal, Missouri. After the opening of the bridge, the old bridge was destroyed and US 36 was rerouted to follow I-72 across the state line. For many years, 72 has remained dormant, with its route in Illinois complete. So with the extension into Missouri, we now see I-72 as it still stands today. We begin at a stoplight on a surface road in downtown Champaign, Illinois. To our left is a monocles, and on our right, a building for lease. This unassuming road is a one-way, but is otherwise normal. However, continuing a few hundred feet from this intersection, we reveal that we are, in fact, at the beginning of a freeway. The speed limit picks up to 55, and we see an exit sign for I-57 signed for Chicago and Memphis. Further along, we see it, a trailblazer sign for Interstate 72, where our 184-mile-long journey begins. With that weirdly theatrical section out of the way, we begin at 72's eastern terminus, a cloverleaf interchange with I-57. From here, 72 exits Champaign and passes through several miles of farmland before meeting an exit with Illinois 47 for Muhammad. From here, we take a turn to the southwest and meet an exit for Illinois Route 10, which takes us to Clinton should we choose to exit it. But no, we continue further, where we meet the first exit construction on I-72, the exit for White Heath. Eventually, we meet the main exit for Monticello, where we meet Illinois 105. About a mile later, there's also a second exit from Monticello, though with no state route attached this time. After a few more miles of farmland, we meet our first exit with Illinois Route 48. This exit can also be used as a means to access Illinois Route 32, though it isn't signed from the freeway. After this, we meet the Pride of the Prairie rest stop, which is the only rest area on the entirety of I-72's length. Following this, we have an exit for Argenta, before meeting Illinois 48 for a second time as we enter Decatur. Although we never directly enter Decatur, we do meet several exits that allow access to the city. After the 48 exit, we meet my home exit, the Cloverleaf for US 51 north to Bloomington and Water Street south to downtown. Next, we meet the ghost ramps for a tea interchange. The seeds for this exit were planted during the construction of 72, back when a freeway was planned to run from Wausau, Wisconsin to Salem, Illinois. We know this today as I-39, though the full project never saw the light of day. As I explained in my very old I-39 video, the project was seen all the way through in Wisconsin, but was never fully completed in Illinois. These ghost ramps are one of the few surviving pieces of evidence of a once-planned freeway. I also theorized that this was the reason that US-51 was built as a freeway for a few miles south of Decatur. If you want to get really conspiracy theory-like, I think that the odd curve in the route of I-57 outside of Salem is where 39 would have met 57, but the evidence here isn't nearly as pronounced as it is in Decatur. Anyways, back on topic. After the ghost interchange, we meet Illinois 121, the primary route used to access Lincoln and the fastest way to get into Decatur when approaching from the west. Following the 121 exit is a sort of mutated cloverleaf between I-72, US-36 east for downtown, and the US-51 freeway stub south for Pena. I-72, now continuing west with US-36 by its side, meets exits for Niantic, Iliopolis, Buffalo and Mechanicsburg, and finally Riverton and Dawson. Next to last, we meet an exit for the Camp Butler National Cemetery, and then meet the old end of I-72 at the Cloverleaf with Interstate 55 and Illinois 97. Might I add, the signs here are incredibly old. Like seriously, some of these signs haven't been updated in so long that you can still make out the faded part of the sign where it used to say Exit 0 instead of Exit 103. Either way, this is where old I-72 used to end. However, in the present day, 72 turns south and begins a concurrency with I-55. US-36 is still with us, by the way. Now with 55, we meet a cloverleaf exit with Illinois 29, which is used to access Taylorville. We also meet an exit for Lakeshore and Stevenson Drives, before turning west and dropping I-55 in an interchange with 55 and Business 55. Now continuing west with just 36, we meet the new-ish interchange with MacArthur Boulevard. We also meet an unusually large interchange with Illinois 4. Finally, we meet an exit with Wabash Avenue slash old US 36 and old US 54. Following this, we leave Springfield and continue through several miles of boring farmland. Eventually, we meet an exit for New Berlin before continuing westward. 
Somewhere in this swath of farmland is a really cool sign that, although it is more of a novelty than anything, is still nice to see. Passing into the last one-fourth of the world, we meet an exit for Ashland and Alexander. Outside of Jacksonville, we turn southwest and meet an exit with Old 36, which also carries our one and only business route. This exit is used to access Illinois 104. Further along, we meet an exit for Illinois 267, which used to be 67 before the expressway was constructed. Lastly, we meet a Cloverleaf Interchange for US 67 before continuing further west, now Missouri bound. Next, we meet an exit for Old 36 in Winchester, where the 36 freeway used to end for many years before being extended. A few miles later, we follow this up with an exit for Illinois 100, which is used to access Bluffs and Detroit. Past this is the Valley City Eagle Bridges, or the I-72 bridges over the Illinois River. Fun fact, Valley City is the smallest incorporated city in the state of Illinois, sitting at a population of 14 people as of the 2020 census. Past Valley City is an exit for the northern terminus of US 54 and Illinois 107. This exit, as well as the next, can both be used to access the city of Pittsfield. Next, we snake through several miles of now forested land until we meet the exit for Barrie, as well as the first interstate side gas station in a while. Following this is a parallel with Illinois 106 before 72 and 36 turn north, although weirdly we turn back south again about a mile later, so I don't really understand why this was done. We then enter the Mississippi River bottoms, as well as an exit for Illinois 96. I best remember the part of this drive through here because of how scenic it is. Especially during the night, you can see the bridge into Hannibal from several miles away. After this, we turn to the northwest and meet the Trumpet Interchange, where the road continues as Interstate 172, and we get off and turn back to the west. Now joined with the CKC Expressway, we meet an exit for Illinois 106, our final exit in the state of Illinois. Finally, we cross over the Mississippi River on the Mark Twain Bridge and into the state of Missouri. Now in Missouri, we meet our only numbered exit on I-72, exit 157 for Missouri Route 79 and the city of Hannibal. About a mile later, we meet an unnumbered exit for US 61 and the Avenue of the Saints. Although not numbered, it is safe to assume that this would be a numbered exit 156. Finally, we end our journey at the current western terminus of I-72, which states, End I-72 construction, continue on west US 36. This sign seems to heavily imply that I-72 is planned to be extended westward someday, and checking the property lines along the route of 36 and the history of MoDOT trying to extend this route in Missouri reveals to us more than you'd first think. Much of US 36 between Cameron and Hannibal has been redone to freeway standards, but just as much of the route was simply twinned. For those who don't know, twinning refers to the act of keeping the original alignment of a highway but simply adding on a new set of lanes usually built to better freeway standards than the old ones. Sections of US Route 36 are up to freeway standards, such as the sections in Hannibal, Macon, and St. Joseph, but a lot of the highway is not graded properly as a result of the twinning. This creates a problem, as you'll see here in a minute. The topic of extending I-72 is one that has been brought to the table a few times, but is brushed aside each time in favor of bigger and more important transportation projects that deserve the funding more than 72 does. While I don't think 72 is a high priority project, and I don't think 36 needs upgrades for a while, I also don't think we should be brushing off upgrading 36 entirely. For many years, the route was a mixture of freeway and expressway standards from St. Joseph to Macon. On the east side of Macon, 36 would then just become a normal two-lane road all the way to Hannibal, where it kicks back up to freeway again just outside of city limits. Back in 2005, Macon, Shelby, Monroe, Rawls, and Marion counties all passed Proposition 36B, which was a movement to widen US 36 to four lanes in between Macon and Hannibal. Ideas were thrown around to make 36 interstate standard, but in the end, 36 was only constructed to expressway standards, with a few interchanges thrown in around the busier areas. The widening of US 36 was finished in 2010, officially making US 36 a four-lane expressway slash freeway hybrid across the state of Missouri. After this, MoDOT went quiet on 36 for a while. The city of Hannibal did try to extend 72 west from its end at 61 to a new end at US 24 near Palmyra, but the Federal Highway Administration vetoed this, stating that interstates must end at other interstates, which is stupid, considering 72 doesn't currently end at an interstate, but whatever. After this, news on 72 went quiet again until earlier last year. In May 2023, a bill was passed in Missouri Congress that approved $2.5 million for a study on extending I-72 west to St. Joseph at I-29, thinking that this would relieve traffic off of I-70. Ultimately, Governor Parson vetoed this bill in favor of upgrades to I-70, but he did say that he wasn't completely against an extension of 72, just that now wasn't the right time. And that takes us up to the present day, where MoDOT hasn't made any more plans public to extend I-72, and it doesn't appear that anything will happen to the route for the foreseeable future. So let's take a look at what they've done on 36 so far to prepare for a potential upgrade, as well as what I think should be done to make 36 ready for a 72 conversion. Starting right where we left off at the exit with US 61 and Hannibal, we see that 36 continues west, meeting an exit with Veterans Road. About a mile after this, there is another exit, this time for Shin Lane. 
from here, 36 turns southwest for about two miles before paralleling its old alignment and turning north for a bit to meet the exit with US-24, where the Hannibal extension of I-72 is proposed to end. By looking at the property lines here, we can see that MoDOT very clearly has enough room for a full cloverleaf, and this makes sense. Recently, MoDOT ran an evaluation on the effectiveness of a bypass of US-61 around Hannibal, dubbed the Hannibal Expressway. While this was also vetoed in the same transportation bill as I-72, I think that this is actually needed. I've been on 36 and 72 a ton in my life, and Hannibal is the golden place to stop when traveling from Kansas City to Decatur, or really anywhere in Illinois. It's got enough businesses that you have the freedom to choose from more than just one or two options, and it's the last stop for gas before you hit Forgottonia in Illinois, which is notoriously barren of any business until you hit Jacksonville, a good hour and a half away. Well, I don't think the Hannibal Expressway is happening anytime soon, when it does get built, because trust me, it needs to be, this interchange will be converted to a cloverleaf most likely, and it will also carry the new alignment of US-61. If 72 never gets extended all the way to Cameron or St. Joseph, this should be where the western terminus of I-72 falls once the expressway gets built. Anyways, moving on from that exit, we pick up US-24 and continue west. Pretty much immediately after this exit, we meet a driveway and a side road, marking the end of US-36's freeway section, and we continue as an expressway for the next couple of miles. Looking at the property lines, there does appear to be some right-of-way reserved for frontage roads, but none for any interchanges. Fair warning now, I'll be using the terms ROW and right-of-way a lot for the rest of the video. The road itself is graded properly between Hannibal and Monroe City, though, so thankfully no major pavement upgrades need to happen besides maybe fixing this one sharp turn outside of Monroe City. Continuing westward still as an expressway, we see that MoDOT does not have any ROW reserved here for frontage roads or interchanges. After turning southwest and meeting an intersection with Route J, we turn back to the west and head for Monroe City, now as a freeway again. As we enter Monroe City, we lose concurrency with US-24 at an exit with US-24 and Route Z. US-36 continues as a freeway for the next two miles as it circles around the outside of Monroe City. Our freeway status unfortunately ends as we meet an intersection with Business 36 slash Stoddard Street. While this is sad, we see that MoDOT has actually reserved considerable right-of-way here, suggesting the potential opportunity of an interchange being built here down the road. After this intersection, US-36 turns back to facing due west as we continue as an expressway. Unfortunately, here we meet our first example of the highway being twinned. The westbound lanes are graded properly to freeway standards, but the eastbound lanes are really hilly and need to be redone. The good news is that the new eastbound lanes can be built, and the old ones can just be converted to an outer road, killing two birds with one stone. From here, we turn to parallel the railroad before making a northward turn around the town of Hunnewell. MoDOT doesn't have any row here, although an interchange is almost certainly necessary. From here, the route hits the small village of Lachanon, where an interchange is questionable in probability, but I do think one should be built here, or at least somewhere nearby. After a few more miles, we meet the town of Shelbina, where we hit our next section of US-36 as a freeway, although it isn't for very long. Here, MoDOT does have right-of-way for frontage roads, and we meet an interchange with Missouri Route 15. We continue as a freeway for another mile until we hit Douglas Street. US-36 then turns to parallel the railroad again. Here we have a weird circumstance, however. The eastbound lanes of 36 are only at expressway standards, but the westbound lanes are a freeway, with exit ramps and a bridge over Route FF. It appears MoDOT will just build a new set of eastbound lanes and convert the existing ones into exit ramps when the time comes. As we enter the small village of Lintner, we meet the routes of N and A, where an interchange will likely be constructed even though there isn't currently any ROW reserved to do so. After this, we curve around the town of Clarence, where we become a freeway shortly as we meet an interchange for Missouri 151. As we continue westward, there is some right-of-way on both sides of the highway should they feel the need to build frontage roads. However, things fall flat again once we reach the Macon County line. As you can see here, the highway was twinned again in between the ethanol plant and the county line. A regrading of the highway likely won't be necessary, however, since the land is so flat. Continuing to the small village of Annabelle, we meet Route V, where there is no right-of-way ready for an interchange, and a business and small residences nearby would make construction here rather difficult as of now. We soon reach the ethanol plant, with Route K alongside it. Thankfully, the road isn't twinned here, and there is considerable right-of-way on both sides for outer roads. That being said, there isn't any reserved at all for a potential exit with Route K, which I do think is necessary, especially given the nearby ethanol plant. As we continue west, we reach Business 36 for Macon. There's no row here for an exit either, so an interchange is questionable at best and unlikely at worst. Now we enter the city of Macon, and the property map gets a bit shaky, but thankfully there's no need for it, since past Kellogg Avenue, 36 is a full freeway again. Now on Freeway 36, we meet an exit with US Route 63, used to access a ton of cities in central Missouri. Next, we turn southwest and then back to the west again to meet an interchange with Long Branch Lake Road, used to access the state park of the same name. Continuing northwest, we meet an exit for routes C and O in Bevere, as well as the first truck stop I've seen since Jacksonville. We continue west, still as a freeway, finally meeting an interchange with Missouri Route 3, used to access Kaleo. Unfortunately, 36 downgrades back to an expressway past this exit. 
Thankfully, there is a lot of right-of-way reserved here for frontage roads, so a freeway conversion here seems easy and is pretty much guaranteed between Missouri Route 3 and Missouri Route 129. Next, we cross the Chariton River and then meet what I think is the most obvious example of MoDOT reserving right-of-way on this entire route. I mean, come on, you can't tell me there isn't going to be a bridge here eventually. Alongside that, there's also right-of-way reserved for the next two miles for frontage roads, which takes us right up to our next exit for Missouri Route 149 and Route P used to access New Cambria. Another good thing about this exit, you can tell there's plenty of room for businesses to spring up in the future. As we continue, the highway is unfortunately twinned again, as it will be from here to Marceline. It isn't all bad though, as you can tell there's plenty of room here for frontage roads, and I don't doubt that there will be a bridge here eventually. Continuing west here, we meet our next example of MoDOT reserving right-of-way for a future interchange, this time with South Missouri 129. After the westbound lanes here are regraded to freeway standards, an exit here is definitely happening in the future, which, alongside the construction of frontage roads, would make 36 a full freeway from here to Macon. From here, we continue west and see that there is still room for frontage roads. Based on this absolutely absurd amount of right-of-way here, I'm inclined to believe that MoDOT was once planning to completely rebuild 36 and then just leave the old alignment as a frontage road as they did outside of Marceline. Either way, there is considerable right-of-way here for frontage roads on both sides of the highway all the way up to Route 5. Next, we meet the future exit site of North Missouri 129, and just like when we first met this highway, there is row reserved for a future interchange here, which is good to see. Next, we cross over a railroad and then do this weird sharp turn here. This oddity definitely supports my earlier theory that MoDOT opted to twin the highway instead of just building a new set of lanes entirely. It'll be interesting to see how they work with the highway in between here and 129, since they likely won't be able to build a new set of lanes all the way to 129, but this is not possible to be converted into interstate standards. Anyway, almost incredibly after the sharp turn, we meet Missouri Route 5 and Route U used to access Marceline. We become concurrent with Route 5 and continue west, now as a freeway again. This unfortunately doesn't last very long, but you can tell there is room for frontage roads in the future when MoDOT comes and makes this a freeway. The road of US 36 itself has constructed the interstate standards between Marceline and Brookfield, minus the intersections, since much of 36 in this area just parallels its old alignment. Continuing further west, we meet another blatant example of a future interchange, this time with Jade Drive, although MoDOT may opt to reroute the nearby Route F to this exit. Past this, 36 curves a bit to the north and becomes a freeway again for the next few miles, meeting Missouri 11 and the city of Brookfield with it. Next, we meet Business 36 with just enough right-of-way reserved for a future interchange, though construction on this one may be interesting since there is a school nearby. Turning back to face almost due west, we see that 36 was unfortunately twinned again as it is for most of the 25 miles between Brookfield and Chillicothe. Thankfully, there is plenty of room for a new set of eastbound lanes, and in the small sections in which there aren't, MoDOT has mostly gone through and regraded the road to match interstate standards, such as this small section near this railroad overpass. Outside of Laclede, we lose concurrency with Missouri 5, which I neglected to note that we gain concurrency with, although we do gain concurrency with Missouri 139 for the next few miles. There is no right of way for an interchange here, although one will certainly need to be built. Ahead of this, we meet Missouri 130, though I doubt next it will ever be built here. We also meet an example of what I was talking about earlier. In this small two-mile section of 36, the eastbound lanes were actually rebuilt so that they weren't graded differently from their westbound counterparts. This doesn't last long, though, and the highway goes back to being twinned again a few miles later. After several miles of the same old stuff, we meet Route W and the city of Meadville, where we lose concurrency with Missouri 139. Even though there should be an interchange here, I'll be honest, I have no idea how they're going to build one here with the existing property line. The road doesn't get much better as we continue into Livingston County. Next on the chopping block is the town of Wheeling and Route V alongside it, where not only is there not row for an exit, but the nearby cemetery is going to make construction here incredibly difficult. In this scenario, I would just say opt for buying right of way over here and building the interchange with State Street or somewhere in between. If they wanted to, they could reroute Route B over here as well. The road itself does appear to be built back to freeway standards here, though I'm not too confident in that statement. I do have good news though, as we enter the city of Chillicothe, the hard part is over. As we pass this intersection for Business 36, US 36 itself is back to freeway standards. We meet an exit with US 65 for Chillicothe, and although the highway does do this weird curvy thing, both lanes are still built to interstate standards, and they are all the way over to the Grand River and out to Utica. Although the route drops to expressway standards for the next 19 miles, the road itself is still constructed to meet interstate standards in both directions. And, as you'll see with Route C in Utica, MoDOT has reserved the borough at almost every potential interchange between here and Hamilton. Anyway, like I said, there is row here for an interchange, and you can even see that they reserved some for Route C to be rebuilt too, which is extra cool. Past this, we turn back to facing due west again, and there is row reserved on both sides of the highway for frontage roads, as well as some already constructed frontage roads. We also see what happens to be an indication of a future interchange, though I'm not really sure why they would need to build one here, since Route D connects back to Mooresville, 
There aren't any towns that need access between Utica and Mooresville. I guess this could be here to connect us back to old US 36, which lies a bit north of here, but comes back to meet us at this spot. Anyways, we meet Route D as well as Rogue, reserved for a future interchange, which will be used to access the town of Mooresville, as I said earlier. Continuing west, there is still room for frontage roads, and we eventually meet Routes M and A, used to access the town of Breckenridge. There is some right-of-way reserved here, although the structure of how they reserved it is odd to say the least. Ahead of this, we meet Route K, used to access nothing in particular. Really, Caldwell County is just kind of empty to begin with. There is some right-of-way here for an interchange, although I'm fairly certain the map here is wrong, given that it appears MoDOT has reserved more right-of-way here than what the map displays. Three miles later, we junction Route B, as well as the right-of-way reserved here for a future interchange, all here and accounted for, too, unlike the last few. Continuing west, we jump back to freeway standards for a bit, meeting Missouri 13 in the city of Hamilton. We take a turn to the north and meet Business 36 as well. I'm not sure if there will ever be an interchange here, but there is some right-of-way, just not for your standard diamond. I'll just spare you the boredom of western Caldwell County and just tell you now, there's no right-of-way here reserved for frontage roads or interchanges, although there isn't really any for frontage roads anywhere except for outside of Cameron, and there's only one spot where I would really suggest an exit, and that's the junction of routes J and D. Finally, we junction Bob F. Griffin Road in the city of Cameron, Missouri, immediately followed by a diamond interchange for I-35, where the CKC Expressway jumps off to follow 35 south, and our journey with 36 ends. As you can assume, the exit with 35 needs an upgrade eventually to meet interstate standards, although I would wager this exit needs upgrading regardless of 72. The traffic here is really bad, and MoDOT's solution of simply erecting stoplights on both sides of the exit doesn't help at all. MoDOT's most recent examination of 72 seems to pinpoint Interstate 29 in St. Joseph as a future western terminus, but due to the fact that our only numbered exit is exit 157, which lines up with I-35 exactly, and the fact that MoDOT's budget is already tight, I don't see them doing any more than they already have to, so I'm only going to follow 36 up to this point. Would it be cool to see 72 all the way out to St. Joseph? Yeah, of course, but the only exits constructed are in Cameron and St. Joseph itself, there's no right-of-way reserve, and most of the highway is twinned throughout DeKalb County. So I think we should just focus on getting to I-35 for now, as that's what MoDOT seems to be, let's be honest, barely prepared for. Will Interstate 72 ever see an extension past Hannibal? Likely not for a while, as the traffic just isn't there yet. But trust me, it'll be there eventually. It was rather refreshing to see that MoDOT is more prepared for an extension than I first thought with all this right of way. And I can finally sleep easy at night knowing that 72 will most likely be extended somewhat in the future, only for a few miles. Not only that, but this is about as in-depth as I can give without walking the entire highway foot by foot. So luckily for you guys, I'm pretty much done with this highway for a long time. Or at least until they extend it. Then I won't ever shut up about it.